Hello and welcome back to Day Talks and this is three things we learned from the weekend in Europe. On to number one, Zidane is slowly applying his style of football onto Real Madrid. Zidane's made a few changes since taking over as Real Madrid manager. The first one is moved to a 4-3-3. Benitez uh, flirted with the idea of playing a 4-3-3, then went back to the 4-2-3-1. I think that was a bit of a mistake. The players didn't really like it at all. But Zidane is sticking to this 4-3-3. Uh, central midfield of Tony Cruz holding Modric and uh, Isco usually, with uh, Kovacic playing at the weekend against Athletic Bilbao. But what we're seeing is the ball's going into central midfield from the centre-backs and they're holding the ball a lot better. Uh, further up the pitch. They're also introducing their fullbacks into the play uh, with Carvajal and Marcelo being their 2K players. Um, Marcelo has just gone out with a shoulder injury and Carvajal actually played left back against uh, Athletic Bilbao and was absolutely brilliant. Um, was thoroughly involved in a number of the goals playing a sort of inverted left back role cutting into his stronger right foot. If you're looking at the stats, um, Carvajal's created more goals than any other Real Madrid player since Zidane has taken over. So really seeing that impact of getting the ball wide to the fullbacks from central midfield. The second thing that I feel that he's added is getting Karim Benzema involved in the play a lot earlier. The ball is going to a, a lot, little bit more direct to Benzema before it was going to, with a 4-2-3-1, it was going to Gareth Bale or James Rodriguez or whoever was playing in that number 10 slot. And then Benitez, uh, sorry, uh, Benzema was playing a sort of poacher role. Now it's getting into Benzema's feet and we're seeing the benefits of that. This link-up play with Ronaldo is absolutely brilliant and they're switching positions, go, you know, switching going, one's left wing, one's a, a striker, switching, it's causing all sorts of problems for the opposition. The third thing that I feel that they've, uh, they're doing very well is, again, switching those positions. Uh, we saw Tony Cruz pop up with a goal um, in the end of the first half against Bilbao and it was just brilliant. Tony Cruz was... Uh, starting off as defensive midfield, but he came into a sort of an attacking midfielder role and um, played a 1 2 with Carvajal, passed the ball to Benzema, Benzema to Ronaldo, back to Tony Cruz in the box, swilled and a brilliant goal. Next thing I want to talk about quickly is just the improvements I feel that Real Madrid need to make to progress in the Champions League. First, um, it's got to be the addition of uh, Casemiro to the side. I've said this. 20,000 times with Real Madrid side. I feel it's a little bit too weak with uh, midfield of Isco, Cruz and Modric. It needs a bit of power to it, a bit of belly. Um, we saw in the, the first Athletic Bilbao go, Alderiz had so much space outside the area, tried to play a through ball, um, obviously intercepted by Varane around the keeper and then uh, Bilbao scored for it. But the issue there was uh, there was a, a Bilbao attacker in the final third, in between the lines, in between Real Madrid's midfield and defence with so much space, acres and acres of space. So I feel like introducing Casemiro there will help in that respect of closing down players that are outside the Real Madrid box. But also in a, an attacking sense going forward with Real Madrid's use of their full-backs, Carvajal and Marcelo, or Carvajal and Danilo getting further up the pitch. I feel that get a defensive midfielder, sit him in between the centre-backs, spread the centre-backs, and you know, the build-up's going to be a bit better as well. The second thing that potentially Zidane could do as well, sort of linked with the Casemiro move, is move Tony Cruz further. He took his goal so, so well. Um, we forget that Tony Cruz used to be an attacking midfielder. His best football for me came at Bayern Munich when he played attacking midfield, um, sort of linking the play together. He was so consciously, tactically of, okay, can he um, influence the game a bit further forward? Yes, I'll move forward. Or can I sit a bit deeper, go into that sort of central midfield role from the attacking midfield role and come and dictate from deep? So that's why I think Tony Cruz should definitely be up there. He's got the talent. Pretty good at shooting as well, could add goals to his game. You know, you could look at uh, midfielders that score sort of 10 goals, you think, oh, that's absolutely brilliant. That's what Tony Cruz could do for this Real Madrid side, but he has to be moved forward. On to number two, Max Allegri and the Juventus players came up clutch at the weekend against Napoli. Take you back to Saturday night, a big, big game in Syria. Uh, first versus second, Juventus were sitting in second, then playing Napoli in first. A lot of big, big decisions for Max Allegri to, to make before the game. Um, one of them was to whether to stick with this 3-5-2, bring Daniel Rigani in um, for the injured Chiellini, or switch his formation. He actually switched his formation and went for a flat 4-4-2, which is really interesting. Defensively, they were very compact from back to front, from their strikers to their centre-backs, there wasn't much space there. And it, Napoli really struggled to break them down. Um, they didn't look like, uh, that, I didn't feel that Napoli were going to score in this game. I thought Juventus was so in control for the whole game. Uh, tactically, Napoli set up with a 4-3-3 with uh, Jorginho dictating the play, Hamzik being the link man and Alan uh, adding the legs to that midfield. But just felt that there was there was this barrier, this barrier of um, sort of eight players that 
Napoli could not break down and credit to Max Allegri. He, he won the game um, tactically and also in a press conference before the, the weekend's game. He said, psychologically, we have got what it takes to win this. We are going to win this. And he's just done them. He's just absolutely done them. Um, you could question Sari's potential uh, lack of big game management. Uh, he's still quite young to this game, obviously coming out of um, finance, uh, taking over a number of lower teams in, in the sort of lowest Italian leagues and now this is his first big, big job at Napoli and he's he's bottling it a little bit. Um, you'd also say that the Juventus players came up clutch at the right moment. The goal from Zaza was a bit of individual brilliance but I felt that it was going to come. I felt that Juventus had the game won. Being defensive in big games for me is a big, big bonus because it it means, it means that the opposition have to break you down, have to come, and it opens up space on the counter-attack. So I think for big games, it's a perfect strategy. Also players coming up clutch, Benucci in interception of greatness. You want to go and check that out. Benucci with a wonderful interception, stopping a, a Napoli cross. The only real chance that sort of opened up for um, Napoli in open play was a ball whipped in from the uh, right wing, uh, from the Napoli right back. Uh, Iguain looked like he was going to score. Benucci, what a, what a touch. Intercepted in the air, pulls the ball out of the air, nicks it away from uh, Iguain. Brilliant stuff from Juventus. I really feel Juventus are going to go on to win Serie A now. The momentum is worth with them. 15 games uh, won in a row. Uh, obviously continuing this crazy Juventus record. And that's about it for, from there, from Serie A. So let's move on. On to number three. We've got to finish it. We've got to finish it on our, our home ground. It is all about the Premier League. North London, victorious. Manchester and Leicester City suffering. Really interesting tactically both of the games were a bit cagey. You felt a bit of tension in the stadium, especially at Arsenal. The fans sort of felt a little bit uncomfortable through the game. And, um, the both games I felt were sort of kicked off by a, a bit a big mistake. You know, in the we had Monreal's foul on Jamie Vardy for the penalty in the. Um, Arsenal versus Leicester City game, which sort of kicked the game into life. Leicester City scoring from that and then having to sitting back and Arsenal having to come for them. Arsenal did very, very well to break them down. They were very, um, they waited for that, the opportune moment. And that man is it, met it a deal again, putting a ball of the highest quality, a big, big moment in the game, whipped it in for Danny Welbeck, who got the winner. You know, great, great stuff from Danny Welbeck. I'm a big Danny Welbeck fan. I was very sad when he left Manchester United. So I hope he can get into this Arsenal team and hold down his position then moving to the Man City Tottenham game again, very, very cagey. And it went for a, the, a mistake, sort of broke the game down. I felt Tottenham weren't really going to break Man City down. And I didn't feel City were going to break Tottenham down. It was very, very narrow. Both teams were sort of playing, um, you know, two inside fours with Sterling and Silva. And then on the Tottenham side, it was Son and Eriksen on the wing, which made it all very, 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 very tight at the high end of the pitch. What I'd like to see uh, potentially Tottenham Man City do is sign wingers in the next window, like traditional wingers that are going to hug the byline and stretch the play further at the pitch because at times we had Zabaleta versus Danny Rose so you know Danny Rose the top left back versus Zabaleta the Man City right back feel that to push these both these sides on they need natural width at the top of the pitch and again uh, the game was broken up by a mistake a handball for me a definite handball I feel that the handball rolling should be changed a little bit if the ball hits your hand in any any sort of time or area uh, it should be your responsibility to get it down if it's not in an unnatural position. I think that's the key word, unnatural position. You look at how Sterling jumped. He jumped with his elbow up and the ball actually struck him on the bottom of his elbow. If you're not, you know, that is a very unnatural position. I don't go walking around with my arm up like that. So I feel that that was definitely a penalty. So the game was opened up by that and then it sort of put the uh, onus on Man City to break down Tottenham. Uh, you know, falling into Tottenham's hand with the counter-attack. City obviously did score, um, equalised Inacho with a brilliant finish following some good work from Cliche on the left-hand side. But then it sort of fell into Tottenham hands again that they could counter-attack, they could hit City directly through the middle. Um, Pellegrini did remove uh, his holding midfielder in Fernando. For me, a big mistake. When you're chasing a game, you need your solid holding midfielder there that sits and everyone else can go and play in front of him. So their City's midfield went back to Yaya Torre and Fernandinho. We've seen Yaya Torre's Poor defensive display. I thought it was a poor display overall in the game. I thought it was atrocious in this number 10 slot. It didn't impact the game in open play. Hit the bar from a free kick, but in open play, it did nothing. Going back to the uh, the transition, the goal that Tottenham scored was on the break. Eric Lamella picking up the ball, running brilliantly at the City defence. Again, no, no holding midfielder to take him out. Fernando could have picked himself up a yellow card there. Just cleaned him out and the, the move would have been over, but... The play developed and Christian Eriksen with a wonderful finish. I love how Christian Eriksen went around the ball. So he slid through one-on-one -on -one in a massive, massive game. 
um, went around the ball, opened his body up and slid the ball into the bottom of the goal. Big, big game players, both uh, North London clubs, Tottenham and Arsenal coming off this weekend. In terms of the title race, everyone is in it. Those four clubs are in it. I could not call it. I don't know what's going to happen. It, this Premier League season has been so crazy that I still feel it's going to be crazy. We don't know. Like City could win it, Tottenham could win it, Arsenal could win it and Leicester are going to win it. It'd be very nice. It'd be a nice story if Tottenham did win it, obviously, with Pochettino um, coming in. But then Leicester, how good would that be? But I don't know what's going to happen. It's completely blown. Predictions in this Premier League season are useless. And it's just They just don't work. It's just too hard to predict who's going to win the Premier League this season. And that's it, guys. That's what we've been having. It. We've been to Spain. We've been to Italy. And we came home to England. What did you think of the games this weekend? Are Napoli uh, out of the title race? Are Man City out? Uh, still in the title race get it in the comments below subscribe if you're new like and uh, have a good weekend guys a good week sorry should i say see you later